the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. California Highway Patrol calling all cars. Attention all Highway Patrol cars. Be on the lookout for a car with a damaged headlight. Possible crushed fender on the right side. This car is involved in an accident on Highway 99 about 6 p.m. this day, in which one man was killed. That's all. Rolls and quits. When a bachelor friend of the family tries to tell you how to bring up your children, it isn't very helpful. You want suggestions to come from someone who is more than an authority on the subject. And so it is with gasoline. The paid for recommendations found in the advertised claims of other fuels are as tinkling brass and sounding cymbals when contrasted with the thoughtful, founded on actual test endorsements given real brand cracked gasoline by the officials of 30 leading cities and counties of California. These recognized authorities choose Rio Grande Crack exclusively to power their police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment. This highest, more convincing recommendation has caused a vast army of thinking motorists to swear loyal allegiance to the gasoline which ranks number one with those who know best because they drive the most. They declare that Rio Grande Crack meets every one of their rigid requirements delivers quicker one-punch starting, steady trip hammer acceleration, the longer reach of economical mileage, extra stamina, and greater reserve power. They know what they're talking about, and intelligent motorists appreciate that kind of a recommendation. If you haven't yet joined the parade of motorists who have made a habit of traveling farther for less money, pull in at your Rio Grande dealers tomorrow morning, fill up with Rio Grande cracked gasoline, and begin letting this police car performance fuel make life easier for your motor and your purse. Inasmuch as the case we are to hear tonight was developed from a story which appeared in the July issue of the California Highway Patrolman, published by the California Association of Highway Patrolmen, we have asked Chief E. Raymond Cato to open our program from San Francisco. Chief Cato... If you should stop 100 motorists and ask each one what the members of the highway patrol do to earn their salary, you would probably be told that the life of a highway patrolman is one jolly round of pleasure. But should any of you be called out of bed in the early hours of a cold, wet, winter morning to take a drunken driver off the road, or to stand in a cold, biting rain for hours directing traffic around some obstruction on the highway, or to attempt to stop a vehicle in which a known hold-up man, heavily armed, ready to shoot it out, is fleeing from justice, or to go to the scene of an automobile accident where, where but bloody bodies are strewn about on the pavement, some dead, others begging for help. Do these and a hundred other things that are the everyday duties of a highway patrolman, and you'll get a different slant on this man and the work he has to do. Everyday emergencies involving life and death arise at a moment's notice. The highway patrolman must meet these emergencies as a matter of course. Tonight's story is another outstanding example of the work done by these guardians of the highway. to get across this road. Yeah, these, these guys, they won't stop for no Looks clear now. Guess I'll cut across. Well, made it all right. He Pat anywhere? Yeah, he, he's coming up now. What's wrong with her, Pat? Oh, I don't know. It's just stopped on me. Uh, I'll take a look at her in a minute. Well, guess we'd better get your load onto my truck and get started. I should have been clearing a Goldman by this time. Well, I came out as soon as you called. What's traffic? 
Oh, it's awful. Looks like everybody in this dog went somewhere for the holiday. Yeah. You should have been on me in New Year's. Boy, think we're still popping around Bakersfield. Don't think I've ever seen this much traffic on the ridge on January 3rd before. Hey, Pat, get your flares out. We're going to have to leave your track. Okay. Uh, back her up for us and we'll transfer the load. Okay. How much room have I got? Oh, about five feet. Come on back. Why didn't you tell me I was so close? Pat! Hey, Bill, where's Pat? I don't know. He was getting out of the flash. He was watching to keep me from bumping the back end, but I hit her anyway. Huh. Why, well, you're a foot from Pat's truck. What? Look, Bill, down the road there. What? Why, well, that's Pat. Come on. Bill, he's dead. <laughs> Captain Leroy Gallion responded to the frantic telephone call of the truck owner, and within a few minutes, the air crackled with broadcast, asking for the arrest and detention of a driver of a car with a battered headlight. The Los Angeles Sheriff's Office relayed the call, and Officer Winchell at Gorman parked his car, motor running and waiting. Then, out of the darkness, fed the runaway car. Winchell started in pursuit. The driver and his car were taken into custody and returned to Bakersfield. Early in April, he is brought to trial in the Superior Court of Kern County with Norman Maine as prosecuting attorney. You say, Mr. Brown, that your truck was parked 14 feet from the center line of the highway. Yes, sir. And the highway is 32 feet wide at that point. Yes, sir. About that, there's a 20-foot strip of concrete and the shoulder is about 6 feet wide on each side. Then your west side, that's the right side of your truck, is about 2 feet on the shoulder. Yes, sir. Would you say that where your truck was parked was a part of a well-traveled highway? No, sir. Objection to us calling for a conclusion on part of the witness. This stain. This accident occurred at dusk on January 3rd? Yes, sir. Was visibility good or bad at that time? Well, you couldn't see so good. Were your lights on, on your truck? Yes, sir. And on Foley's truck, too. That is all. Your witness. No questions at this time. Call Captain Gallion. Captain Gallion. You saw me swear the testimony about giving this case to the truth, all truth, nothing but the truth, something gone? I do. Take stand. You are Leroy Gallion? Yes, sir. Captain of the Kern County Highway Patrol. Captain Gallion, tell us briefly what occurred on the night of January 3rd in relation to the case now on trial and the defendant, James. Uh, well, I was traveling north on Highway 99 at about 6.20 or 6.30 on that date, but I noticed a group of cars stopped on the highway about a uh, hundred feet from a bridge and about 13 miles south of Bakersfield. I stopped and found that a man had been struck by an automobile. Was he injured? He was dead. Who was this man? A Pat Foley, a truck driver from Los Angeles. What was the cause of this man's death? I don't know, sir. You say he'd been struck by an automobile? Yes, sir. His neck was broken and he was injured rather severely otherwise, including a bad head injury. Was the person who had driven the machine which struck Foley present at that time? He was not. Had anyone seen this man when he was struck? There was no one present at the scene of the accident. What did you do then? I placed flare pots about the scene of the accident to prevent the destruction of any clues. And about that time, an ambulance arrived. And what did you do? I accompanied the ambulance to Bakersfield and detailed officers E.W. Edison and M.H. Bowles to go to the scene and search for clues that might help identify the hit-and-run car. Did they find any such clues? Uh, Yes, sir. They found that the top hinge of the door on the killer's car had struck and damaged the truck driven by Mr. Brown. And they found a board, oh, approximately six feet long, that had been knocked off the truck. And then several bits of small board, not from Foley's truck. Did they find anything else? Uh, Yes, sir. They found some small pieces of bone buttons and some broken headlight lens. Did they, at that time, ascertain the make, model, or color of the missing car? Well, they found paint particles adhering to the truck, which indicated that the car was an opalescent gray. The marks on the truck indicated that the car was a coupé. Is this car found? Uh, yes, sir. It was stopped near Gorman by Officer Floyd Winchell. That is all. Your witness. Now, uh, Mr. Gallion? Captain Gallion. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Captain Gallion. Now, Captain, were you present at the time the car was found? No, sir. Did you see the defendant James in the car? No, sir, but I understand Never that... mind what you understand. Just tell the court what you know. Do you, of your own knowledge, know that the defendant was ever in that car? I do not. Did he ever tell you that he drove that car? No, sir. Then you, of your own knowledge, do not know that the car was the same one the defendant drove on the night of January the 3rd? No, sir. I see. That's all. 
Call Officer Floyd Winchell. Floyd Winchell. You swear the testimony about to give in this case to be the truth, all truth, nothing but the truth, nothing God? I do. Take that. Mr. Winchell, tell us any conversation you had with the defendant on the night of January 3rd. Well, I, I got a call on the radio that a car had struck and killed a man on Highway 99 down below Grapevine. I figured he'd be coming on over the ridge, so I parked my car and waited. Pretty soon I saw a car with one light out, so I stopped him. By him, you mean the driver of the car? Yes. I opened the door and told him to get out. And the defendant stepped out, and as he did, kind of unsteady on his feet, he took hold of the door. And I looked at him and I said, uh, you've had something to drink, haven't you? And he said, no. He denied having anything to drink. Were you alone then? Yes, sir. Officer Baker came up just then, though, and the man admitted that he'd drunk a couple of highballs. I asked him where he had them and he said he stopped in Bakersfield. Then I questioned him about the damage to his car. What explanation did he give to that? He told me that a truck had backed into him. Did you inspect the car? Yes. At that time, I took my flashlight and looked at the right front of the car while Officer Baker was talking to Mr. James. I noticed that the right headlight rim had imprints of what appeared to be clothing. My objection I looked at... is, Your Honor, not responsive. Sounds like for conversation. Objection is good. Mr. Winchell, after the conversation which you just stated, uh, what did you do? I checked the car with reference to damage to it. What did you find? Well, the right front light was out, and there were marks like the imprint of clothing on it. The license plate and the fender had the same kind of marks on them. And there was a dent in the hood of the man's uh, car, as if a head had hit it. Objection, Your Honor. Conclusion of the witness. Sustained. Did you question the man further? Yes, we questioned him about the car that was supposed to have backed into him. Was he evasive or straightforward about it? He was evasive. He said he was confused. What happened then? Well, Officer Geary, Bowles, and Edison came over and took the defendant and his car back to Bakersfield. Thank you. That's all. Well, just a moment before you step down, Mr. Winchell. There are one or two questions I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Winchell, when you noticed the defendant driving along the highway, was he driving at a normal rate of speed? Yes, sir. He was not driving erratically? No, sir. What first attracted your attention to him? The right headlight was out. Was he trying to get away? That is, did he appear to be running away? No, sir. Now, when you apprehended Mr. James, did you walk him around? Yes, sir, around the car. Did he seem to walk in a normal way? Very, I would say, unsteady on his feet. Hmm. And this uh, conversation that you had with him as to how he got his car damaged, he didn't seem to be at all certain, did he? No, sir. Hmm. That's all. Call Dr. Lambert. Dr. J.G. Lambert. Raise your right hand. You saw Mr. Red's testimony about giving this case to the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, self you guard. I do. Take stand, please. Dr. Lambert, are you a physician and surgeon at the Kern General Hospital? I am. On January 3rd last, did you give the defendant James a sobriety test? Yes, I did. And what was the result of that test? His breath was alcoholic. His face flushed. His pupils were dilated. His general uh, motor activity normal. And that is, with the exception of passport. And just what is passport? A test in which the subject attempts to touch his nose with his eyes closed. Is that a test for sobriety? It is. What other tests did you make? Well, he could walk a straight line. His rhombus sign was all right. His gait and walk all right. His speech was normal. His reflexes oversensitive. His pulse rapid and his respiration below normal. Did you take a blood test? Yes, I did. I found the alcoholic content of the blood to be 1,800 of 1%. 1 is that alcoholic stimulation? Yes, but not intoxication. He was stimulated by alcohol, but I cannot say he was drunk. Thank you, Doctor. Cross examine? Thank you. Now, Doctor, just what is the point of intoxication? In my opinion, 0.2%. Point 0.2%. Point Thank you. Now, Doctor, in your opinion, would there have been more alcohol in this man's blood, say, at 6 o'clock than at the time you examined him? Definitely, yes. The amount of food the man had consumed would affect that. And might a person suffering from shock have exhibited the symptoms you've enumerated? Might. In your opinion, Doctor, was Mr. James suffering from shock? No. Well, aren't dilated pupils a symptom of shock? Yes, but also of intoxication. But they are a symptom of shock. Yes. That's all. Call William Snare. William Snare. You saw me swear testimony about giving this case to the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, self you guard? Yes. Take stand. Your name is Snare? Yes, sir. What is your occupation, Mr. Snare? I'm in charge of the of identification in Kern County. Did you, on or about January 3rd, have occasion to examine a car involved in an accident on Highway 99? I did. 
What did you find? Evidence of extensive damage to the right side of the car. How did you happen to examine this car? Well, officers Geary Edison and Bowles of the California Highway Patrol asked me to make an examination of a truck and a coupe. Now, uh, taking the truck first, describe what you found upon examination of the vehicle. Well, along the left side of the truck, 58 inches from the ground, was a mark that looked as if it had been struck with some metal object. The paint was removed for a distance of several feet, and an upright reinforcing strip about six feet long had been knocked off. Was this strip later found? Yes, sir. It had also been run over by an automobile with a diamond tread tire. What was the color of this truck and board? The truck was painted an aluminum color over an undercoating of white paint, which in turn had been put on over a blue coat of paint. Now, Mr. Snare, will you describe the second automobile which you examined? Yes, it was a Plymouth Coupe, opalescent gray with a diamond tire. What was its condition? Well, the right front fender was dented, and the hood was dented about the center on the right side. The right headlamp had been shattered. The horn was bent, and the radiator grill was smashed, with a long marred streak on the paint above the right door. Was all the window glass intact? Yes, it was. Upon closer examination of this car, what did you find? I found that the dent in the fender had been made by striking some semi-solid object, such as a human body. Objection, counsel leading the witness. Sustained. Could the dent have been made by being struck by a human body? Objection is calling for a conclusion on part of the witness, Your Honor. Sustain. Would, uh, did you find any evidence that this car had struck a human body? Yes, sir. Did you find that this car had struck any other object? Yes, sir. I found in the storm drain above the door particles of paint similar to those taken from the truck. On the right rear door hinge, I took other particles of paint that matched those from the truck also. I show you a microscopic slide containing particles of some substance. Is this the paint which you found in the storm drain? Mm-hmm. It is. Now, this slide contains other particles. Are these the ones you took from the truck for identification purposes? They are. What means did you utilize to ascertain if these specimens are identical? Chemical analysis shows them to be identical. Microscopically, they're the same, and spectrographic tests also show they're the same. What evidence did you find that indicated that this car had struck a human being? Well, on the rim of the headlight were marks that looked as though they'd been made by some sort of fabric. These marks were also found on the license plate, on the horn dome, and on the fender. Did you identify these marks? Yes, sir. I photographed and enlarged them until they showed plainly the weave of the fabric which had made them. Have you identified this fabric? I have. It's the same as that found on the body of Pat Foley. Just how can you prove this? Well, the fabric taken from Foley's trousers shows a sort of whipcord pattern, having nine threads to the inch. Now, these cords are wrapped with a smaller, different colored thread, having 12 threads to the inch. The ridges shown on the photograph of the headlight rim were made by the cords and show nine markings to the inch, and the smaller diagonal marks of the rim show 12 to the inch. You can say positively, then, that the cloth from the victim's trousers made the marks on the headlight rim. In my opinion, yes. Based on years of experience investigating cases such as this, as I would say that the marks shown on the coupe were made by the clothing worn by Pat Foley. Just what other physical evidence did you discover? I found on various parts of the automobile several small threads which the microscope shows to be identical with the material of Foley's clothes. Anything else? In the cuff of Foley's trousers, we found a small piece of glass, which we believe to be from the headlight lens of the coupe. Was it? Yes. How did you ascertain that? Well, we had spectrographic analysis of this glass made and compared it with a spectrograph of the glass from the headlight lens taken from the car itself and picked up at the scene of the accident. Were they the same? They were. Could these pieces, or this piece of glass, have been placed in the cuff of the victim's trousers? Objection, Your Honor, calling for a conclusion of part of the witness. He couldn't possibly have any knowledge of that. The same. Do you know whether or not this glass was placed in the cuff of Foley's trousers? I do not. No, sir. Did you see anyone place it there? No, sir. Do you know if it was placed there by anyone? Jackson two is already asked and answered, Your Honor. Sustained. Mr. Snare, did you find any other physical evidence that this car had struck a man? Well, Officer Bowles brought me two pieces of bone button, which he found at the scene of the accident. And later, Officer Edison found on the running board of the coupe another piece of button very similar. On trying to match them up, I found that Together, they completed a button which evidently had been broken off the jacket worn by Foley. Chief, Your Honor, please. I move that be stricken from the record. It's being conclusion of the witness. I don't think that I don't care any what you think. That man has no right to prejudice my client's interest by injecting his opinions in his own testimony. Your Honor, Officer Snare is offered as an expert in the field of identification. In that connection, his opinions, based as they are on years of experience, 
are not merely offhand opinions, but expert opinions. I rule with the defense that the witness at best sticks to facts found by the investigation. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Can you show, Mr. Snare, that the button in question came from the jacket of Pat Foley? Yes, sir. Clerk, produce the jacket entered by the people as Exhibit 4 for evidence. Right here, Your Honor. Mr. Snare, would you demonstrate to the court and the jury just how you determined that this button came from the jacket in question? Well, you'll note, Your Honor, that at this point a button has been pulled from the jacket. It has not been done with much force, but only with sufficient force to break the thread. If, on the other hand, a great deal of force had been exerted on the button, it would have broken suddenly, leaving part of the button in the fabric and the threads intact. Now, you'll find that such is the case here at the bottom of the jacket. By placing the fragments of button which we have here in this position, it's clear that this broken button was torn forcibly from this position. Yes, but please, Your Honor, I have a button here. Is this button, Mr. Snell, one that came off this jacket? Well, I can't say without a closer examination. Where did you get this button? Well, I took it from this jacket at the preliminary trial, Your Honor. Where did you do that? Why, I, uh, well, I knew this testimony was going to be introduced, and I, I wanted to show that, that this button could not be the one drawn from the jacket. May I ask, Your Honor, why defense counsel was permitted to tamper with the evidence of the preliminary trial? It's my duty to protect my client at all costs. But not at the cost of stealing evidence. Do you accuse me of stealing this button? Well, you're guilty of now, gentlemen. 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 If you please, Your Honor, I, I think I can help clear this up. After all, as is evident on examination of the jacket, it doesn't make much difference if the counsel does have a button. There are several missing. Your Honor, we are trying to show that this button, reconstructed from pieces found at the scene of the accident and picked up from the running board of the coupe, make up a complete button which we contend was broken from the jacket of Pat Foley at the time he was struck down by the automobile of the defendant, James. Well, I think sufficient evidence has been introduced to prove that point. That is all, Mr. Snare. That is our case. If it pleases the court, at this time I would like to call the defendant, James, to testify in his own defense. Right, Edward right. James. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony about to give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, self you God? I do. Take the stand. Mr. James, how old are you? Uh, Forty-eight. Married? Yes, sir. Any children? One. Are you a drinking man, Mr. James? No, sir. No, I may take a drink every two or three weeks. Well, sometimes it's months before I take one. Do you drink to excess? Get drunk? No, sir, never. Were you drunk on the night of January the 3rd? I was not. Tell us briefly what you did on that night. Well, about 2.30 in the afternoon, I left by failure. I've been there on business. I stopped in Bakersfield and went to the Southern Hotel. I was tired and thought I'd dress for an hour or so. It was cold that day. I went in the bar and had a highball and ginger ale and whiskey. Mm -hmm. Then I ordered a sandwich, ham and cheese. During the time I was eating, I had another highball. And when I finished eating, I took another one. And then I left. And did you leave Bakersfield immediately? Yes. About what time was that? About 5 o'clock. And were you feeling perfectly normal at the time? Uh, Yes, I was. Were you intoxicated? No, sir, I was not. Now, Mr. James, did anything unusual happen while you were on the way home? Oh, that is too long, thanks. Yes, about 7.30, I was arrested at Gorman. Mm -hmm. And before that time? No, sir, not that I remember. What is the last thing you remember after leaving Bakersfield? Objection. Attempt to lead the witness. Oh, Your Honor, there's no attempt here to lead the... (laughs) Overruled. Thank you. Uh, You may answer that question, Mr. James. Well, I remember passing the intersection of the Arvin Road and Highway 99... I don't remember anything else until I was stopped and gone. And what happened in Gorman? Well, I remember a car that drove up alongside me, and traffic officers got out, and they told me to get out of the car. They asked me if I'd hit a man, I said that I had not. You have no recollection of striking a truck or any person? None at all. Thank you, Mr. James. Cross-examination. Thank you. Mr. James, you heard the testimony of Officer Wintle, didn't you? Yes. You heard him say that you told him when he stopped your car at Gorman that a truck had backed into your car. Did you hear him say that? Well, uh, uh, yes. Was he telling the truth or a lie? Well, I, I, I don't remember. Did you or did you not tell him that the accident occurred near Baker Street? I, I, I don't remember. Did you tell him that on that occasion that you were in a hurry to get home and that you didn't stop because of that fact? Well, I, I, I might have. Upon the arrival of Officer Baker and upon being questioned the second time at Gorman, did you or did you not say to Officer Winchell when asked if a car ran into you, it might have, but I'm not quite sure whether it was a car or a truck? Well, I... I, I, I may have said that. I, I don't remember. Mr. James, 
Do you remember leaving Bakersfield on the night in question? Uh, yes. How many drinks did you have? Oh, two or three, maybe four. Did you have any after you left Bakersfield? No, sir. If you had had any other drinks, you'd remember it, wouldn't you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Your memory's all right on that point, isn't it? Yes. You say you had how many drinks? Oh, two or possibly three. Well, according to this statement, a statement given by you to an insurance adjuster on the 4th of January, you said you might have had four or five drinks. Is that right? Um, yes. Yet you don't remember running over and killing a man. I object, Your Honor. He's trying to bulldoze my way. I'm trying to do nothing of the sort. I'm trying only to break down a massive deliberate defense built up to protect this man from punishment for an act as brutal as if he had deliberately taken a gun and shot Pat Ford. Oh, if you I'm Honor, trying to prove and I intend to prove that this man so benumbed his brain that he could drive into a human being, kill that human being, and then drive away without offering to stop and render aid. A crime no less heinous than murder! I object, Your Honor, oh, no oh, oh, money oh, oh, to do so. Oh, James was acquitted on the count of negligent homicide, but convicted under Section 480 of the California Vehicle Code of hit-and-run driving. His case is now on appeal. Whatever the final verdict, Pat Foley cannot live in. Lucky indeed is the football coach who has many experienced players returning. On the gridiron and the highway, it's experience that counts. Rio Grande Crack Gasoline is an experienced gasoline. Last year, it was the power under the hood for the police cars, fire engines, and other emergency equipment of 30 leading cities and counties of California as they raced or cruised, as occasion required, over 55 million miles of highway. And this year, Rio Grande Crack promises to eclipse even that formidable record. Drive into your Rio Grande dealers tomorrow morning and begin the habit of giving your own automobile the benefit of experienced police car performance with Rio Grande Crack gasoline. Experience counts, too, with motor oil. And that's why millions of motorists in 45 nations have made the phrase Sinclairized for safety the byword of the highways throughout the world. Sinclair motor oils are stronger, smoother, tougher. Here is one lubricant that does not break down regardless of extreme heat or high speed. Sinclairized for safety by asking the same Rio Grande dealer who gives you police car performance with Rio Grande cracked gasoline to refill the crank case with rugged, supple Sinclair Opaline, a smoother oil that won't break down, and that comes to you in sealed, tamper-proof cans at only 25 cents a quart. California Highway Patrol calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 200 regarding the hit and run driver. Suspect in this case is taken into custody by Officer Winchell. That's all. Rose and Clerk. Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande.